they yours. Hit that one more time. I am, I am the, the number one determinant, number one determinant of, the of the success or failure. Or failure. Here we go. Of my, of my student. Hey, y'all, you have a strong summer. Kick some butt next year. Thank you. Thank you. Appreciate you. That's the mindset. That's the attitude. Love you guys. And we are live. Good morning. Good morning, good morning, good morning. Welcome to week 103 of the Virtual AP Leadership Academy. Let's see who we got in the building this morning. I see Renee Graham. I see Marsha Poe. Let me know where you guys are coming from as well. Renee is right right here in Montclair, New Jersey. Good to see you, Renee. Uh, Marsha Poe is out there in San Diego. Janine Wilkins is in is in Alaska. That's where she resides. She's out there doing her thing. Uh, we got my brother, Demetrius Scott, Rodney, Rodney Richardson, Rodney Williams, Yolanda McKinney. Um, I saw a Badia, Southern California, Jocelyn Nelson out there in Florida, J Vanessa uh, Zeskin, Connecticut. Uh, great to uh, great to see you here, uh, Marsha Poe. Kareen Paul, PhD, out there in Connecticut. My man, Michael Benton, Cincinnati Ready 103. Dot McKee Vegeta, who, who did a slamming job a few weeks ago. And if you didn't see that recording live, if you didn't see that interview or conversation live, make sure you go to the video and um, on the virtual AP Leadership Academy and see my talk with Dot McKee Jeter retired principal man we had a good day garfell Garfar, wt create and educate dr sheikah houston principal tammy taylor out there in detroit michigan holding it down uh by uh byrian collins is in the building karima Anque is in the building good to see you and congrats again on all them awards you you racking up wendy chinchilla jennifer bortvit um mates or Mappis, I'm not sure. You got to send me them phonetics one day. Uh, Rashad Davis out there in Vegas. Uh, the hero, N Nidaye, I think it is, is in the building. Priscilla Russ, Lysandra Brackens, Morgan Conyers, Sherry Bowens, Miles, Ronald Pugh, Juanita Presley is in the building. Juanita, you know we got that, um, I'm going to talk about it in a few minutes. We got the MBK conference coming up. So I know you'll probably be in the building. Tommy Vincent Hilliard, the queen, my wife, Kimberly. Uh, uh, I'm going to say, forget the middle part. Kimberly Broughton Cafele is in the building. We got Principal Julia Rich in the building. Good to see you, Principal Rich. We got uh, Jean Lee in the building. Yo, she said, good morning on fire in Philly. Laura Fitch is in the building. Tony McClenney is in the building. Kevin Jack. Grace Castaneda is in the building out there in Texas holding it down. Nyerka Coy Bush in Freehold holding it down. I've only been to Freehold once in my life. Albert Buckles. I say that because I'm in Jersey. Albert Buckles is in the building. Bring that fire, man. We, man, I got a special guest here. She's going to be bringing them flames. Y'all hold on for a second. Um, Live vets in the building. Melissa Jones, Chew News in the building. Yeah, I got, you know, I got to, you know, Melissa, I got to rock Jackie Robinson today, man. We got the whole Jersey 42 where we at over here. We got the hat. You know, this is, yesterday was Jackie Robinson day. So, you know, every, every year that I do this, you know, it's, it's Jackie Robinson. Not just today, though, the, but the month. You know, I got his Negro League jersey next week. We had his minor league jersey <laughs> the week before. We got his first opponent. In the minor leagues, Jersey City. That's going because there's five Saturdays in April, so we got it covered. Who else we got? I'm getting ready to transition, y'all. I see what time it is. Priscilla Rose, Charlena Hadi. We got Professor Sherrod Lamont Law is in the building. 
We got Sheikah Houston on the individual now. Salma Hussein is in the building. Y'all, I got to go. I also, let me let me just say this. We also have the folks that don't write comments in the building. My mom reminds me of that sometime. Matter of fact, she's one of them, right? So well, let me make sure I say good morning to the folks that don't comment because you matter as well, right? So before I formally say good morning, hit that retweet button, Twitter. Hit that share button, Facebook. YouTube, just tell your friend, send them an email, let them know we're we here, right? So with that being said, let me say to everybody, good morning, greetings, welcome to week 103 of the virtual AP Leadership Academy. And as I always say, I don't know about you. I think I know, though, because you're here, but I can only speak definitively for myself, right? So I just want you to know real quick before we get started how I feel this morning. I'm on fire! Man, y'all don't know, man. That's like a release every seven days because I don't, I don't do that any time in my life except for Saturday morning at 11 o'clock. And it's like, it feels good. Let me say it again. It feels good. So what, what you need to do, find your release, right? Might, might be praise the Lord. You know, whatever, whatever it, hallelujah, whatever it is. Find yours and go to it, man. It, it feels good on Saturday you know, so so let me let me just holler at you one more time. I'm on fire! Woo! Whew. That's what I need, man. <laughs> That's what I need. Let me let me let me let me jump into this real quick. April 16, my, my quick my quick messages, announcements, and message, motivational message. I'm a little different today. Because yesterday was the 15th of April. We sometimes we call that payday, sometimes we call it tax season deadline, whatever it is. But even though that's Monday, hope you took care of it. But it's also Jackie Jackie Robinson Day on the 15th yesterday, right? And you know, I I I, I don't know, man. Since I got into all this Negro League and all these five fifty jerseys I got upstairs of these Negro League jerseys. This is not a Negro League jersey. Obviously, this is Jackie Robinson's jersey. But I got deep into the Negro Leagues, man. And, you know, just studying it, being fascinated by it, being fascinated by Jackie Robinson. And, you know, I, th I was thinking about him a lot yesterday. Some of you know that follow me on social media. I took a pic in this, this uniform and, and wrote a long post, man. Longest post I've ever written in my life about him, about, about racism and segregation and racial hate and bigotry and critical race theory and, you know, all that kind of stuff. Hopefully you read it. If you didn't, just go to my personal page or my Twitter page or my blog page, Principal Kefele writes, and it's right there at the top. And take check it out. But, but, but with Jackie Robinson, we're talking about a man that broke the color barrier, you know, being permitted to play in the majors in 1947 and becomes rookie of the year in the same year. Then becomes most valuable player two years later. So again, you know, I kept thinking about this, him who was not considered the best player on his Negro League team. He played with Satchel Paige, Buck O'Neill, and, and, and others. He wasn't considered the best. He just was considered one who had the temperament to endure what was going to come his way as a black player going into the major leagues, right? So think of, so when I think about that rookie of the year, most valuable player two years later, it, you can't help but think about all the other black players that played in the Negro League that if just given the opportunity to play in the majors, what they would have done. Obviously, they did after 47, but I'm talking about way before that, right? Having the opportunity to pitch against Babe Ruth, for example, right? And all the other great Yankees and, and, and other ball players and what, what they may have been able to do or may not have been able to do had they faced a uh, a satchel page or pitcher that faced 
a Josh Gibson who hit 800 home runs in the Negro Leagues. You know, we'll, we'll never know that history. But denied opportunity because they were born black. Right. I honor Jackie Robinson. I'm busting. I'm rocking this on this side. I'm rocking a 42 today. That's 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 his number. Right. I, I'm wearing the hat today. Right. But but the hat, you know, it, where, what side we at? You see that there? Principal Cafe. Like, man. So 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 now then went on and appeared in the all star game six times out of his 10 years in the majors. Six World Series, one one inducted into the Hall of Fame 1962 and named to the All-Century team in 1999. Wow. Here's my point. I'm looking at Jackie Robinson and I'm looking at the odds, you know, the death threats, right? The ridicule, the hate mail, you know, all that kind of stuff, the hate speech. And I said, but he endured it and overcame it. And his name lives forever. So then I thought about us. And our obstacles. I cannot tell you the number of letters. I keep saying it to you. The number of letters I receive from people every week. Emails, inboxes, DMs. I can't even read them all. I try my best. I know there's probably somebody on here saying, you, you haven't responded to me yet. Y'all don't realize the volume that I receive. It's, 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 like, it's like, you know, a rock star's mailbag in the old days. It's like that. Right. So but but I, I I usually look at the first paragraph and if I can, in most cases, and it's usually somebody that's looking for advice over over a bad situation. And I'm saying here, you look at a Jackie Robinson and you look at what he overcame. Because of his passion for the game of baseball, he was passionate about this game. He was passionate about this sport. So so I, I, I will overcome it and I'll be the best in the process. So I'm saying to you out there, you out there somewhere in America, you some out there somewhere in the world, is leadership your passion? Let me ask you that question again. Is education, our children, is school leadership your passion? Is this your thing? Is this what you do? Is this why you wake up? I mean, I'm up this morning because of this, this platform called Virtual AP Leadership Academy. My wife could come down here on camera right now and tell you, I live for this daggone Saturday thing, man. This, this is what I'm about. It's not my whole life, but, but I love me some Saturday Academy. I spend the whole week preparing. My guess who's in the wings right now, I've been working on this interview since last Monday. So I'm asking you, are you passionate about this work? I'm particularly talking to the ones who are struggling with, with the environment you're working in, the leadership, your staff, the parents, the students, the community, whatever it is. And you're like, I don't know. I don't know. I don't know if I can endure this. I don't know if I can take this. I don't know if this is what I want to do. I'm talking to you. You. Let me get up in the camera. You. And I'm saying to you, what is your excuse? Are you passionate about this? Do you want this thing? Because if you do, you're gonna and you, you're gonna figure out a way. Because one of the first questions I'm gonna ask my guest today, she talks about unconventional leadership. That's part of her thing, man. And and she said, and when she talks, when she defines it, she's saying challenging the status quo. So we we'll get into it in a minute. But I'm saying to you. Are you willing to fight toward those things you are passionate about despite the adversity, despite the obstacles, despite the challenges, despite the pressures, despite the demands, despite the people who are not on your side? Are you willing to fight for that which you believe in? I'm going to leave it there because I feel myself getting ready to preach. Somebody probably say you already preaching, right? So, so, so let me let me stop it there because that was just supposed to be a quick thirty seconds, right? Let me say to you real quick, y'all, to the first timers who are here, welcome, right? If you met me on the road somewhere, as a, you know, the camera's reversed, so I, I I get this thing, man. Here we go. Here, let me do it without the camera. There we go. So, so, so here, if you met me on the road, yeah, I'm a little different. <laughs> Because on the road, they paying me, right? So I, I got I got to be a certain way. 
But I'm in my house right now. Ain't nobody going to dictate my behavior right now. I'm just going to be me and let it ride. Right? So, so if you're new to me, you know, this is what you get on Saturday. Right? Although we got a guest coming up today. Um, but I welcome you and make sure you check out the previous 102 videos uh, on the Virtual AP Leadership Academy YouTube channel. We got gold on there, platinum on there, diamonds on there, gems on there. All you got to do is watch. It's all free. Secondly, uh, I'll be leading the School Leadership Institute. It's called the School Leadership Institute with Principal Kefele. I do that every year. It's going to be July 12 and 13 in Charlotte, North Carolina, all day. We even talk during lunch and dinner if, if folks want to be around me during lunch and dinner. So that's all day, Charlotte, North Carolina. Google School Leadership Institute with Principal Kefele, fifth annual. Google that and all the information will come up. Register and I hope to see you in Charlotte, July 12 and 13. But then right after, I'll be in Atlanta at the Deaf Ed, D-E-F, Deaf, as in Deaf Jam, right? So Deaf Ed Conference, July 16 and 17. And um, myself, Anthony Muhammad and others are going to keynote that in Atlanta. My, the, the organizer will be my guest on this platform coming up in May. So make sure you Google that, Deaf, D-E-F, Ed, E-D, conference, Google that and you'll see all the information. And I should add the My Brother's Keeper um, symposium is coming up April 28 and 29. I'm going to keynote that. That's going to be virtual. And also, uh, who's the other keynote? The New York City Commissioner of Education, David Banks, will be the other keynote. So go to um, Google again, My Brother's Keeper New York. It'll come up register. I think it's free, but it's virtual. All right. I keep telling you all I'm going to phase out that personal Facebook page of mine for the for this platform. So what if those of you that watch on YouTube, go to that, go to my virtual AP Leadership Academy page next week and try to shy away from my personal page because I'm going to phase that one out soon. All right. And lastly, congrats to all the folks that got hired recently. Oh, man. Assistant principals and principals, congratulations to you. And those of you who are interviewing this week, next week, or interviews coming up, knock it out the park, man. Bring this with you. And knock it right out the park. Grand slam. And go to my go to the Virtual AP Leadership Academy page. Watch them interview videos, y'all. And then when you when you knocking it out, just think about what you got from them videos. Principal could fail. Right? That's 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 how you do that, right? So enough, enough said there. Um, I'm ready to go. Man. I, well, you know, y'all know I got to do this real quick, man. You know I got to do this. That's my newest one. The Equity and Social Justice Education 50, the Assistant Principal 50. That's the two newest ones. And uh, you can get them on Amazon. Go to your other device right now. Get them out the way. All right, my announcements were long today, man, because I spent time with on with Jackie Robinson and all that. But I'm ready, man. I, I got a guest on here. I'm getting ready to bring her up. I got Principal Jessica Cabine. I met her quite a few years ago, and we've been cool ever since. And then I said, man, I need Jessica on this platform. So I reached out, and she said, let's do it. So let me bring her up here. And, and I got on the screen now. Principal Jessica Cabine coming out of Minnesota by way of Arizona today out there in the sunshine. Good morning, Principal Cabine. Good morning. I I wasn't nervous till I realized the comments. I was only in the private chat, and then I saw how many people were on today, and now I'm nervous. Oh man, <laughs> no, no need, no need, no need. Oh. Yeah, and 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 I should say to folks, hit that share button, hit that retweet button, let them know we are here, we are ready. Principal Cabine, I guess I'm I'm gonna be calling interchanging. Principal Cabine and Jessica, and uh, that's kind of how I do with the guests, so either way. But um, before we jump into anything, before we jump into your bio, as I ask every guest that comes on here, you know, the, people come on this, on this platform on Saturdays or watch the videos for different reasons. But one of the things I think that everybody in life is looking for at some point is just inspiration, right? So Thinking about the past seven days of your life, whether it be your personal life or your professional life, 
tell share with us that something that may resonate with someone else a win w-i-n a win you had this week that may resonate with somebody else that you and i may never meet a win of the week oh my gosh i i do those every every day um i would say this the win of the week right now for me is just spending some quality time with my junior son um, we're out in Arizona right now doing some college visits and I've taken vacation days where I'm not working or coaching or speaking or, <laughs> you know, yesterday yes. was just truly like a, a day with my 17 year old and just offline and enjoying life. And, um, I, I take that for granted too much. And I think that was just something I needed is I think we can be on all the time, especially with email, social media, parents, kids. Um, so just cause 20, Technology is on 24 seven doesn't mean we have to be on it as well. So going offline for a day was like just really important and valuable for me in this season. Love it. You know, you know what I'm loving as I'm looking at the, the thread on the right now, this, I'm looking at, you know, it's much, the stream yard thread gives you all the yes. platforms, right? And I'm looking at all the people <laughs> who are taking the time to welcome you by name. Right. See, cause we, we family here, you know, and mm -hmm. that's, uh, yeah, I'm, I'm looking, I'm, I'm loving that. You know, let me put another one up there. And it's, uh, you know, good stuff. Folks, let me share with you who our guest is today. She didn't give me her long bio. She gave me her short bio, right? So I'm trying <laughs> to get them long ones, but I read them. Jessica is the principal of Ellis Middle School in Austin, Minnesota. Prior to that, she was the principal of the happiest place in southeastern Minnesota, as she calls it, the Woodson Kindergarten Center. She has been an assistant middle school principal, a special education assistant director, and a special education teacher. Jessica was awarded the NAESP, that's the National Association of Elementary School Principals, Vinci Digital Leader of Early Learning Award in 2016. In 2017, was named the Minnesota National Distinguished Principal and was the 2021 dive ed dive principal of the year Whew, that's a lot y'all she is a naesp middle level fellow and a future ready principal that's with thomas murray I, I gotta get him on here too jessica is the author of hacking early learning balance like a pirate unconventional leadership and lead with grace, subtitled Leaning into the Soft Skills of Leadership. So that was four books. But by far, her favorite space is the one that involves being with her husband, Rob, two sons, Kenny and Isaiah, and of course, the family dog, Herman. Jessica can be found on Instagram, Facebook, <clears throat> and Twitter at Jessica Cabine, and on her website, Jessica Cabine. Dot com. So let me let me let me let you see the spelling of her last name there. So you see it. So Jessica Kabeen, one word dot com is the website and you can find her on all those platforms. We got a lot to talk about, folks. You know, I usually stretch this to 90 minutes. Hit the share button, hit the retweet button. Let them know we are here in the building. We talk in school leadership for the assistant principal and for the principal and anybody else, because when you're talking assistant principal leadership, then the commissioner of education needs to hear. The superintendent of schools needs to hear. The assistant superintendent, the director, the supervisor, the principal, they all need to hear. This is not a conversation that can be isolated to the assistant principal. You know, I'll say this to you, Jessica. A lot of times when I'm doing the, the assistant principal workshops and sessions and the principal thinks he's going to leave the room, I say, <laughs> or, or principals, or, or 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 an assistant superintendent. I said, wait a minute, y'all. Hold up, hold up, hold up. I, I saw you walk out and stay for a while, right? I really need you in this room. I really need you to hear what they're hearing, as opposed to ju them just hearing this on their own and going back to their respective schools. What what are, what are your thoughts about that? When when the folks in charge, even when the principal leaves the room where the teachers are receiving the in service. Oh, it's it it. It shows the culture. It shows what's valuable and what's important. When you leave the room, the message is pretty clear when you walk right out. And I, I just, I, 
learned so much from my years as an assistant principal, and I hope that um, I'm able to lead others. And I've had the fortune of working with two amazing assistant principals. And I think it's so important as school leaders is we're always learning. And so when you leave that room, you're you're leaving the learning that you can gain from others too. Like I have not, I have, and we talked about this before. I mean, I have a bunch of middle schoolers that could give me a pretty negative Yelp review on some things that I could still be learning in my years of leadership. So I think it's so important that we continue to be in the room and in the learning because we all need to model that growth. That's right. That's right. I, I left this one up on the screen there. Elena Zachary Ross, superintendent out there in, in, in Michigan. I met her in Muskegon Heights when she was superintendent there. And she's just, you know, agreeing that, yeah, superintendent needs to listen as well. You mm -hmm. know, uh, Jessica, there's, there's three questions that I ask all my guests. And I, I okay. want to ask you the same. Number one is, as an educator, who is Principal Jessica Cabine? Oh, wow. Uh somebody who cares about kids and and i would and it's i think probably more intimidating is my mom is here <laughs> she just showed up and um brandon and uh nate some of the people i work with at ellis like they're taking their saturdays they don't get enough of me at work that they're here <laughs> on the weekend too but um i think that would be something like i try really hard to model that nothing is beneath me in, in regards to my leadership so i'm out helping in the cafeterias I'm supporting students in our special education classrooms. I'm at school events. I'm at community events. Like I just want people to know that I'm I'm present. I'm willing to learn and serve and care about everyone in our community. Love it, love it. And I need you know I want the audience to know because see two of your buddies, uh, Sine Bell, yes, yes, and, and Beth Huff, mm -hmm. they um they were they were both on here. You know so you know yeah. they you you know you guys are connected and I just want the audience to know you know who's on the screen all the time and, and, and what are some of those relationships, et cetera. Right. In fact, you and Sine have the same publisher. Yes. Right. And, I, and, and we, we talk, um, all the time. We're both, all three of us are pretty busy educators and parents yeah. and, and daughters and spouses, but, uh, we connect, we text. It's sometimes I'll, when they were both middle school principals, I'm like, does this ever happen to you? And Beth was like, yeah, on Tuesday, you know, and Sine and I just spent a weekend in Chicago together. And I think yeah. if I could give you some, um, a nugget of advice for assistant principals is, is find connections outside of your school, find that safe person, that friend, that, that post-it note person that you can talk to outside of that context, because they can give you the support and encouragement you need, because so often we get stuck in the weeds with the, the people in the cheap seats, the negative comments, the things that really just heavy on our hearts. But having Beth and Sine in my corner and just walking me through some of the more challenging parts of my career has been probably the, the most be beneficial for me personally and professionally. I, you know, I love that you said that because as, as the folks that, that tune into this platform regularly know, because I've told them several times when I, when I start preparing for Saturday, I really take it seriously. And I read so much about you over the past week. And, um, you know, one of the things it's, it's, it's an article on you and, and you say, when you're talking about unconventional leadership, you, you state it, yeah, you can do the reading and you can do the research, but it's it's those human connections with people that you can that, that, that understand the work that you can connect with and, and, and learn from one another, dialogue with one another, grow with one another, you know, and, and that stood out for me when I read that. And that wasn't a, that was like two years ago when you did that um, interview or, or more. But um, but for you to bring that up so early, you know, it just. It speaks volumes to who you are and what you believe in as, as far as your leadership. So let's keep going. My second one, um, why, why did you enter the field of education and what continues to fuel your passion for this work? Um, I was a non-traditional teacher. So I went into education after my first four-year degree and I would definitely, my mom was a huge champion for me. Um, she was a speech pathologist. My dad was a guidance counselor. And between the two of them, they found a really unique uh, degree called music therapy because I loved music and I really enjoyed working with people with special needs. So um, I graduated with a music therapy degree and I went into the workforce working with adults with disabilities and utilizing music as a vehicle to help them gain the necessary skills to be successful in the community. Um, I met an incredible man in my 20s that I ended up marrying that said, you'd make a good teacher. So I went back to school and became a special education teacher and worked in the St. Paul Public Schools for eight years and then moved up into administration in that realm. And I feel like 
that that non-traditional approach into school really has helped shape who I am and and how I see others because um, just because you think you're going to have one pathway. I think I still haven't quite figured out what I'm going to do when I grow up. And that's okay. I think it's okay that you you separate your calling from your position. They're not connected. Um, and I also think too, that because of that, I've really found passion in finding other people find non-traditional paths too. Like just yeah. because somebody didn't think you could be this when you were in middle school, doesn't mean you can't be it now. That's right. That's right. You know, and, and just listening to you, I thought about, um, you know, a, a mutual friend of ours, Salone, Thomas L., Principal yes. L. Yes. I, you know, I posted that you were going to be on, on on a variety of different Facebook platforms. And, and his comment was, she's a beast, right? Yes. <laughs> she's a beast. You know, and we know that in a very positive way in mm -hmm. terms of slang. Yeah. So I, I, I hear you on that. You know, um, a lot of people... In, in, in education, a lot of teachers, counselors, et cetera, make a decision somewhere along the way that they want to go on and into leadership. And there are probably a variety of different reasons as to why they want to make that transition into leadership. I had a variety of different reasons. But as I ask everybody on this platform, was there a one that sort of dominated all the other reasons that you said, but I want to be a leader for this reason this reason in particular just matters to me was there one or was it was it just a, an assortment i i you know i think one of the unique things about and i, and I probably not unique to me but just in general is P, i've had the blessing of people seeing things in me that i haven't seen in myself i think if any of you out there struggle with your own imposter syndrome or self-confidence and just not sure if you have what it takes to be in the next level. I've really been blessed to have people see things in me that I haven't seen in myself. Like, yeah, you could totally do that. And I think that's something within our culture that we can work on too, is just supporting and encouraging each other and seeing the gifts that we have versus all the things that we don't have. So I think that that's really been helpful for me as people had said, you know, you'd make a really good leader. You're really good at creating a story, sharing a message. Um, and then just moving into those layers. So I think that's been probably the most beneficial is just leaning into other people's suggestions and courage and encouragement. I had this professor, in fact, I had three and mm -hmm. writing was not on my radar, you know, and folks that know my story wasn't much of anything on my radar, but I, 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 I eventually went to college and the professor said to me, he said, you write well. And he didn't he didn't know my story. So he, he didn't know what, I, you know, from whence I came. He just said to me, you write well. And I and I was in disbelief. But he, he insisted. He said, no, you write very well. And because he said that it played a significant role in me going on and becoming this author that I've become. But then in that same season, another professor said, you speak well. Now, I never heard that in my life. You, I don't you speak well. Are you kidding me? He said, you speak well. Nah, no way. No, you speak well. You're a speaker. Huh. And here I have. I've given over 2,500 speeches in my lifetime. And then the third one said, you're a leader. And I knew I was a follower. But he said, you're a leader. So now when I, when I think about that, which is pretty often, I don't think I've ever said it on this platform, though, for a living. My life centers around writing, speaking, and leading. Mm -hmm. Three things that someone external to me said about me that I was not aware of. Mm -hmm. So I'm saying that to reinforce what you said, sometimes we gotta listen to them other voices. I know some, I know a lot of times in slang, in the slang world, we'll say block the noise, right? But sometimes we gotta listen to that, sometimes, especially when it's voices that matter because Absolutely. they may speak things in us that we don't see in ourselves. Well, and I would yes and that, especially for the middle for the principal and middle school secondary assistant principals, this is this is the toughest part of the year. People yeah. people give up on kids. People are like, I've told them this 150 times, they're still doing it. They're tired. They're coming at you and it can be really exhausting emotionally, mentally, um, spiritually, all of it. But what I would encourage you to do is something I don't is sit with the compliments. When yeah. someone gives you that compliment, how often yeah. do you say, oh yeah, no, 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 you caught me on a good day. You know, you're dismissive and 
and you write it right off, but you'll sit with the negative things you hear from some stranger or some random one off, but you sit with that compliment, sit with that and and try to connect that back to your calling. It's going to really help you through this critical last quarter of the school year. Absolutely. Absolutely. You know, Jessica, you, you talk, I, I mentioned this before, but I want, I'm going to say it again now that, you know, formally, you, you talk a lot about unconventional leadership, which you define, and I quote, challenging the status quo and being creative with your resources to find new results. So with that, my, my question is, what would you say to that new leader out there who wants to challenge the status quo, but feels trepidation about rocking the boat? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I would, I kind of, um, authenticity, be who you are because you were called to lead in this position. Don't, don't be like the old principal. Don't, I've tried that. I've tried to, to fit in the mold of who was there before me. And it just never works because then you're not authentic to yourself and you're not authentic to who you're serving. So I would say for sure, be who you are. And if it's in the pit of your stomach and you're like, I need to do something or say something, do it. And you, it but won't be perfect. And that's what it's not lead being graceful because I don't don't look at me dancing out at, at parent drop off. It's pretty embarrassing. It's not about sure. graceful. It's leading with grace, which is leaning in and learning and making mistakes and moving forward. So absolutely just being authentic, trying new things and modeling failure. I'm going to tell you right now, the staff at Ellis Middle School went through three iterations of a block schedule this year, like literally three weeks into school, we had to change the schedule and then we had to change it again. And then we had to change it again. And I could have been the leader who could have blamed other people or said, Oh, you know, it was the system. It was this or that. I had to sit up in front of 80 people and like, yeah, this was awful. Like we have 850 kids. I think 30 of them didn't eat lunch today. I don't know if any teacher went to the bathroom. Like it was awful, but I think just owning like, Hey, we're trying this and this was why we tried it. This is what happened and it didn't work. But I think just being transparent, especially in education, we have to start doing things differently. And the only way we're going to do that is not being afraid to make mistakes and being vulnerable with that. Not afraid to make mistakes and to be vulnerable. And, and let, let, let me be vulnerable for somebody out there that may be looking at me as some kind of superstar because I'm not. I, I, I've been in those shoes, Jessica, with those schedules, those master schedules. <laughs> I, I I know what that is to to completely screw up a master mm -hmm. schedule, right? And and but 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 all we can do is bounce back. Mm -hmm. right? we, that's that. I mean, because it's done. So yep. now we bounce back. I I learned how to delegate, right? So I yep. no longer want any parts of the master schedule. This you have that mathematical mind and etc. You do that, and I'll just oversee the mm -hmm. way how the, the, the unfold. So. So with that, you know, you um you've written four books. Your most recent is Lead with Grace. Again, subtitled The Soft Skills of Leadership. I'm going to flash it on the screen once you start talking. I have to go to the other side of the room and get it because I didn't yep. bring it over here. So uh I'll have it in a few minutes. But but you know that let me let me go back to that title, Lead with Grace. That word grace, <clears throat> we all use it. We may use it loosely or it may be it, it, it may be very prominently with a lot of intentionality. So when I was preparing, I said, let me let me look up this word grace to see the, the, you know, this, this, just to see the formal definition in terms of you using it. You can get into into how you interpret it in, in a minute. But I looked it up and I said, great. It's a grace is courteous goodwill. Or an attractively polite manner of behaving, or or I should say, and simple elegance or refinement of movement. And I said, man, that's a powerful word. Mm -hmm. So 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 my question to you then is, what made you choose this word, grace, and 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 what is your motivation of attaching this word, grace, to school leadership? Absolutely, uh, I would say my years at the kindergarten center, uh, where I left an assistant middle school principal position of 800 kids. And I went into a kindergarten center. I said, how hard could this be? It's 405 year olds. Like I've, I've been in a middle school for decades. I can handle this. Um, and, and those six years were probably the most challenging pro professionally for me because I had to really lean into communication and what does that look like? And how do you serve when you never taught? I was never a kindergarten teacher. And all of a sudden now I'm leading a building of 400. So building that that compassion, that empathy, that integrity in the work. And I would say with, with grace, even um, 
I'm probably going off, but I'll come back. I promise. When I started at the middle school as the principal, then our school mantra is expect the best of our staff, of our students, of our community. Like if you go into any interaction expecting the best, not worrying about the, the hidden comments, the hidden agenda, or the perceptions you think are going to come through, um, you can just be super, you're more transparent, you're more willing to listen, you're not fighting or combative. And I feel like that's been such a, a hard piece in leadership is just leaning into what you don't know and being willing to learn from others to grow from that. Yeah, yeah. <clears throat> being willing. And that's, that's mm -hmm. I think that's the key word, willing to lean into others to learn what you don't know. That's, you know, that's, that's, that's take, that's removing the ego. Yeah. Right. And, and coming to grips with the fact that we don't know it all. Right. Um, a good buddy of mine, Dr. Marcus Jackson always talks about eating humble pie. Right. And, uh, I think, I think the way he goes, what's he say? Stop eating the, the ego soup. And, and eat the humble pie, something like, I'm probably screwing it up. He may be on here right now. You can correct me, uh, Doc. But, um, but with that, with leading, with lead with grace, which here we are, folks. Lead with grace by Jessica Cabane. And, and, and you know, my track record is good, so I'm gonna say it real quick. Every book I put on this screen goes to number one on Amazon in the, in, in, in the, uh, in the category upon which is listed. So lead with grace, we'll promote it again after you've heard a lot of what Jessica has to say, but um, you can get it on Amazon. But you broke lead with grace into the following eight categories. Mm -hmm. You said authentic grace, vulnerable grace, grace with empathy, grace with integrity, communication grace, graces, grace in relationships, social graces, and grace with yourself. Mm -hmm. I want to look at each of those individually. So I know we're going to go to 1230 or more today, but uh, I want to look at <laughs> I want to look at each individually um, in describing authentic grace. You say to be unapologetic in your leadership style. Right. Let me let me say that again for the audience. Be unapologetic in your leadership style. Is, is what Jessica's saying, Principal Cabine, as it relates to authentic grace. So I got a three-part question. <laughs> so Ooh, we, okay. yeah, three, yeah, three parts. I want you to break down what exactly are you saying when you say to be unapologetically authentic in your leadership style? What, what, what does that mean? And it's back to that calling and that why. So I'll give a story with that. So um, the previous position, principals in the positions I've served before school has always been morning meeting time where you're meeting with the adults, you're answering emails, you're doing a lot of work. Um, in the buildings then since I've come in, I have flipped the script on that. And if it's not every week, it's every other week. I'm out greeting kids at buses and parent drop off every day. I'm not apologetic about that. If teachers want to come talk to me, especially in January in Minnesota, when it's like 40 below, get a hat on and come out and see me. Mm. But it's, I'm not my my calling and my why is my kids. And for school leaders and assistant principals, that might be the one positive interaction you have with families and kids for the day. And if I don't ground myself in that 20 to 30 minutes of, of having time with kids and recalibrating my why, I'm not regulated for the rest of the day. So just knowing like, what's your calling? What's your gifts to the position and serving in those roles and not being afraid to say, you know what, even though this is how the other person did it, this is how I want to do it moving forward. So, 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 you know, it's, I love the answer because it, it, it really flows right into my follow-up. Yeah. Like, like, what would you say to the viewer out there this morning who is being that, that unapologetic leader or who, who aspires to be that unapologetic leader, but being unapologetic is drawing the ire of his or her superior. Mm -hmm. Communication. That's where the communication and the clarity comes in, too, because I think had I not been really clear with why I was doing what I was doing, people might have been like, oh, she's avoiding us. She doesn't want to do the hard work. She doesn't want to do this X, Y and Z. But when I was super clear at the beginning to say, this is my why is to serve the students and families of Ellis Middle School or Woodson Kindergarten or whatever. And in me serving my why and how that looks for me is I'm out greeting families in the morning or I'm out um, at community events. And so that's why you see where I'm at. If you need me 
or if you need something from me, here's how you get a hold of me or here's how you contact me. So I always try to make sure that it's it's really clear and tight communication so then people don't have to question what is she doing when she's out um, trying to do the Harlem Shake or the crazy shuffle dances that I'm awful at. But I do it and it engages kids. It builds relationships with families. And I think for middle schoolers, it makes learning fun again. Like we're going to start the day with a smile and a hug and a high five. And if anyone didn't say it today, I'm going to tell them I love them. And I can also get a good gauge of how they feel as they're walking in the building and if there's any supports they need before their day starts. You know, it's um, as, as you just described yourself in terms of style, I was literally able to see, you, right? And 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 you you said you're not good at it, but 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 I can even see that, right? I I I can see you just being in the midst of your students, engaging your students, endearing yourself to your students. I see it. I I see the leadership style. Is your leadership style? And I'm 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 really off my script on this one. Okay. Is your leadership style? rooted in something philosophical that, that 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 you conceptualize first and it translated into action or is it just action that just kind of came out of nowhere oh that's a good one uh i think probably looking back especially with my background in special education and special needs is just ensuring all students have a high bar they can achieve and finding creative ways to get there I think, you know, when I when I first started working in special education, that was back in the day when there were still institutions, like in the 70s and 80s and 90s. I mean, like this was the 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 ability and potential of people with especially adults with special needs was very different than what it is today. And I just hope that I can continue to champion that there's very different and unique ways that we can all serve and learn and lead. And I think it's my job to help people see creatively. We can all get to an end outcome, but it might look different how we get there, the roads we take. I, uh, yeah, I, I, I love that. You see, what, you can see every, every time I, I either think leadership style, talk to people about leadership style, read something leadership style, I'm always thinking about myself as related to leadership style. Because I had my style, but my style was not random. It wasn't haphazard. It was, it was rooted in a leadership philosophy mm -hmm. of who I felt that I needed to be in that space. Right. So 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 therefore, my style was being driven by something. It wasn't just happening. And that's what I'm hearing from you. The same thing. So 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 therefore, given the volume of aspiring leaders on this call right now in real time, because because everyone on here is not a, is, is, is not an administrative leader, but also given the volume of assistant principals or new principals or even veterans who are still honing their craft. Right. What would you say to how one goes about developing a leadership style? Mm -hmm. Because and, and, let, and let me let me couch that with this, because I see people. I'm in like yourself. I'm I'm in schools on school days, and not not yourself as often as me because you still got a school to leave, and and I get to see folks who are in the position but they're just reacting all day they're responding all day they they're not they they're not driving the bus they're, it's like they're a passenger on the bus right so so what would you say to someone out there about how they go about developing a style that is uniquely theirs absolutely uh two two parts to that the first one i think that i want to just share is that your your calling is not a competition so be very careful like if you don't like being out in 20 below weather and it's not your thing, like don't do it just because I just said I did it. If you're on the socials and you see, oh my gosh, this person's doing this, this person's doing this, this, don't do it just because you see somebody else doing it. This is not a competition. These are ideas. They're crowdsourcers. We can collaborate. I always talk about celebrating. So if you see something really awesome somebody else is doing, instead of being critical of it and like, oh, they could do this because they're this and this, celebrate it, like it, retweet it congratulate them and then move on. Like, don't, don't feel like just because somebody else is doing it, you have to do it. Because I think too often, especially as aspiring leaders, 
Um, we lean into the title more than the actions behind the title. And so you think, well, to be a principal, I have to be this, this, and this. Nope. To be a principal, it's what you feel that the position and what you're uniquely suited to do is. So that is about putting those boundaries and bandwidth around your position. And I think this is going to sound really counterintuitive, but in order to lead well and figure out how to lead, you got to slow down. You got to say no to some things. You've got to put boundaries around your workday. And I was awful at that when I was an assistant principal. I put in 12, 14 hour days, five days a week, and then on Saturdays. I I tied my calling of serving people into the connection of my position. And I forgot that I have a huge calling as a mom and, a, and as a wife and as a, a person in a community. And I almost burned myself right out. So I think it's super important that you also put boundaries around your work time. Because once you have that, that um, margin in your day and you have some bandwidth in your life, you'll be able to really hone in more tightly into your calling on the day job, if that makes sense. But it sounds very counterintuitive in this culture that we're on all the time, we're doing all these things, slowing down, pausing, and putting some boundaries around your work and your life is really essential. You are resonating with a lot of people on this thread, I see, because they're, they're quoting you in terms of protect or putting boundaries around your time. Mm -hmm. um, and let me, let me get the exact words, protect your boundaries. Right, putting boundaries around your workday, etc. Mm -hmm. and, mm -hmm. and, and then the other thing that so many people were writing, I said I better write it as well. Is when you said your calling is not your is not a competition, and 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 I want to stay there for a minute. Mm -hmm. You know, get time. We all right. Your your calling is not a competition. Let me let me shout this into the universe real quick. Your calling is not your competition because i got folks out here that think they competing with me and i'll just leave that right there it's 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 not a competition mm -hmm. especially if you have embraced it as your calling how could your personal calling be a competition with somebody else it's not a calling then you in this thing to compete. You 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 trying to be noticed, right? Mm -hmm. It's it's it's, it's I man, I'm glad you said that. I, I, I wrote it here so that way I can keep it. I you know, and, and see your other life, you're a speaker. Mm -hmm. So you know, as speakers, we borrow from each other, right? Oh, absolutely, <laughs> absolutely. No, and I and I think once you release that, you're gonna the weight of what other people think, once you release that weight, you have the freedom and flexibility to really do what you're called to do. You really do. And it, and I wish I would have learned that 20 years ago. And I'm still relearning it. You know, you still see certain things you're like, oh, I wish I could do that. Or, oh, I want to be doing that. Nope. I'm here to call and serve in the role that I'm in today. That's, that's, that's it. So I, I love that you said that. So, so, so let's, let's keep moving. Vulnerable grace. We're breaking mm -hmm. down the eight steps and, and you say that Vulnerable grace um, is giving it your best, even when you are at your worst. Hmm. Mm -hmm. I want you to hear that again. Give it your best, even when you are at your worst. Right. So my question then is, what are you saying here? And, and, and give us an example of vulnerable grace, if you can. But 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 first, what like like what are you saying? When, when you say give it your best, even at your worst. So even if you're going through and it, you know, it could be big or small, but you could, you know, even if you had like an awful morning at home with your kids and you had to roll into the parking lot and go to work, do your best, try to separate, put some boundaries around what happened at home and what's going at school. Um, if you make a mistake in on social media, um, in an email, in a master schedule, just show up the next day. Again, don't don't carry the weights of all the errors and mistakes you've made in your career or in your life ahead with you. You got to release it, let it go, and go forward. That's not saying a hundred percent. I think the staff at Ellis Middle School would say I'm about a seventy three point five percent accurate leader, and I'm good with that average. So don't think it's a hundred percent either. Like just continue to try and move forward. But when you start to weigh down, oh, I didn't do this right. I didn't do this right. You're less and less worried worried or, or available to try new things because you're so afraid of making another mistake. It, it reminds me of, um, you know, this would, this would really be only for football fans 
or even folks that know the New York Giants. Um, Eli Manning threw a lot of interceptions in his career. But one of the positive things about him with the interceptions, as people would always say to commentators, he didn't dwell on those interceptions. He didn't remember those interceptions. Mm. So although he was throwing interceptions, it clearly he still had the courage to throw tough passes. He didn't look at the interception and say, oh, I better tone it back. He still he was he he, re, he remained competitive because he didn't dwell on the mistake. So I so there's somebody out there listening right now, based on what you just said, you can't dwell on the setback. No, you can't dwell on the mistake. You're going to make mistakes. You're going to have setbacks. That's not like a might or possibly. I'm telling you right now, you're going to have a setback. Many, mm -hmm. you're going to make mistakes. But the question is, what's your response? What's your response and your reaction? You're going, you're going to dwell on it. You're going, to, you're going to wallow in it like, like a pig in slop, right? Or are you going to get back on your feet and overcome? Mm -hmm whatever the mistake may be. And I think, and I want to just, cause I, I'm not, I want to just talk a little bit about a person like personal perspective too. Cause I think so often we try to be this perfect principle and separate our lives from our, from our positions. And when I was the assist, it's interesting. I was the assistant principal at the same building. I'm the principal now, but 10 years ago, I we were going through an adoption process and the adoption was terminated three weeks before school started. So in essence, we lost our son. Mm. And I, and I had to be so vulnerable with the staff to just say, we are struggling right now as a family. Like oh. we had planned this adoption. We had this room set up. We had visited. We were ready to go and and, and it dissolved. And I was a shell of a human being for six mm. months of my life. And I was trying to be a middle school principal. Talk about a crying middle school principal, like AP yeah. principal. Like they had separate bathroom spaces for me because I would be fine for a moment. And my mental health just really tanked. And so I had a counselor, but I was super transparent with the staff to just say, Hey, I cannot talk about my personal life at work right now, because when I walk in the door, I can only focus on this, but you just need to know that I'm struggling with it. I have help and support outside of my school with my faith and with counseling support. But I think it's okay. If you're going through something personally, you don't have to broadcast it to everybody, but find some safe people within the building that you can share that with. Because I think being transparent with our mental health and our needs um, personally only helps to grow professionally an organization that we really want to continue to build and thrive. Because I think we've had a lot of stress, trauma, and triggers in the last three years. And just pushing it under the rug or saying we're just moving forward without addressing it is going to really diminish the capacity of the staff that are in our schools today. Appreciate you sharing that because yeah. uh, and I, I guess it was maybe two, three weeks ago, we were, we were talking about that in terms of do we have those folks in the building? that we can lean on mm -hmm. because as you know that principal position is a lonely position even when you have assistant principals <clears throat> it's you're still number one in the building the, the buck still stops with you even though you have a team and it can be a lonely position mm -hmm. and i i had those folks that i could lean on in those times when because 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 you know people look at you as principal they look at you as superman and superwoman like you like like you can endure all things they don't see you as human as a human being so to speak so, but I had folks in my corner, I had folks in my circle, I should say, that I could lean on, mm -hmm. that understood me as a human being, not just as the principal of the school, right? Yeah. Important stuff, important stuff. So can one, can one be optimally effective, but vulnerable at the same time? Mm -hmm. I, think you, I think you can't be effective if you're not vulnerable. If you're not real with the people you're serving, you're not revealing the the pieces of you that make you who you are and why you're doing the job, you're not going to be transparent. You're not going to be authentic. And people aren't going to really want to move forward with you, especially when you're trying to disrupt the status quo, especially when you're trying to share the stories of students who haven't had a voice. If they, if they don't see that you're making mistakes in the process and learning and growing from it, they're not going to buy in and walk the journey with you. So, so, so someone out there, let's, let's continue with this. Okay. There's, there's 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 someone out there, I'm sure, either live right now or will see mm -hmm. us later. And they think they've got to be right all the time. Like, I've got to have all the ants because I'm, I'm the new leader. I can't mm -hmm. afford for them. Like, there's an old Southern expression. I can't afford for them to see, catch me flat footed. Right. And meaning meaning I can't afford for them to for, for, for me for them to see me without an answer. Right. 
or to see me without a solution. Talk to us that, therefore further, because I know you, I know you, you, you went deep with it. But let's go further in terms of that new leader out there, that assistant principal, mm -hmm. that aspiring leader, that that that, or, or that veteran that still is still wants to grow and get better and better and better, which we hope for everybody. Talk to us about the um, what's the what's, what's the word I'm looking for? Talk to us about that. There's no problem with being vulnerable and yep. still maintaining your effectiveness. Absolutely. Well, a, a funny story, when I went to the kindergarten center from the middle school, just apparel, like in the middle school, I, I tended to dress more professionally with suits and skirt suits and, and things like that. Learned my lesson the hard way when a kindergartner got stuck in the slide and I had to climb up there and get them. Like, that's not going to work anymore. Just because I thought this is who I needed to be as a middle school assistant principal is not going to work at the kindergarten center. I didn't know like where the tinker toys were and I didn't understand why we had tinker toys at the kindergarten center. And so if I would have led forward saying, well, this is, you know, we have to be paper pencil, this and this, and you know, no play, no, no deep learning, no science exploration. I would have lost a ton of opportunities to lean into people who had been in the field longer than I had been alive. Like Ellie Verdorn just retired two years ago, but she was a kindergarten teacher the green frog teacher since 1978 you don't you don't dismiss that type of knowledge yeah. and wisdom and you don't say just because i have a title i know more than this green frog teacher because she will school you around the corner and back again like that woman taught me so much in my role as a principal from her role as a teacher and i think if you if you come in with that title and i have to know it all and be it all you're going to lose the people in your schools that you can really lean into and learn from and and a lot of times that learning comes across Sometimes maybe not the, the po most polite way. It might be like, you know, you have to have the people in there that are going to challenge you and question what you're doing because then that message can be more clear and concise as it moves forward. So I really do look for people to poke holes in things for me because if you come in to a leadership team with this is the polished document that I've created all by myself with no insight from anybody else, like that thing is going to is a disaster. I can tell you that right now. It's going to blow right up on you. So it's really important that you lean into other people and don't look at it as a weakness, but as a leverage point. Like in order for this to really become something I want for my school or for my community, I need to make sure all eyes are on it so it's polished and in, in, in doing the best it's serving its purpose. Not perfection, but serving a purpose. Yeah, I, 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 love, your, I love your response because I, I think it's a part of just being a great leader to have people, to have smart people around us who will poke the holes as opposed to people who are intimidated by us or people who feel they should say yes, yes, yes to everything we say, then how do we grow? So that's a, that's just a part of being a, a great leader, having those people, positioning yourself where people around you have the, have the audacity, feel comfortable to be able to poke holes and, and not lose points from you because they mm -hmm. did it. Right. Where you're doing things. Mm -hmm. And that's that relationship piece, too, is and when you have to have those hard conversations with others, whether it's you being the receiver or the messenger, you know, making sure that there's a way to follow up a day or two later, because in education, we do not like having hard conversations. We don't want to hurt other people's feelings, even even when the intention isn't to hurt the feelings. It's not about the person. It's about the actions within the position following back up in, in like that reflective circle. So they know, OK, yes, this interaction happened, you know, but we're moving forward now. Like we're over this and now we're going to go ahead and continue to to work and build our culture and community. That's right. We're going to keep moving. You know, let's go with grace with empathy. When you when you talk about grace with empathy, you're saying lead without judgment and with understanding. Right. So lead without judgment and with understanding. So I, when I when I read that, I was thinking to myself, I said, how, how does one lead without being judgmental specifically in terms of judging uh, um, uh, members of staff or judging students who are going way against the grain or judging parents who are not on the same page with us or judging community who also may be on different pages or judging colleagues or even judging superiors. How does one go without being judgmental when when we've got that real life stuff in front of us? So with that, my, here, here's my question. I said I want to I want to tie that to a specific question. And I made it long, so I got to let me just read it. When 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 was a leader in a racial, cultural, socioeconomic environment that is completely unfamiliar, that is completely different from what one is accustomed to? 
How does one go about developing a deep and meaningful understanding of this environment without judging it to the point that their leadership is an asset to the entire school community? That was a I guess, long way. No, but I want to, I'm going to share the story. So we are off before we started, we talked about on my website, there's some students of some girls that are covering their face. And I said, Mari, Mari has taught me to be a better person in principle. And I'll have to show her this link afterwards because now we're Instagram friends. Now that's, you know, or whatever street cred I need with that. But my first interaction was Mar with Mari was I was called her into the office to do a positive office referral. So at the middle school, we were trying something where we were recognizing students for doing things really well and calling their parents. So when she came in, I said, hey, and I said, hey, Mary, Marie, it's good to see you. And she lit me up. She let me, she was like, my name is not Marie. My name is Mari. And she started screaming at me. And she was like, how do you, what do you know? You know, how do you go off telling my name wrong and correct? And, and so when you say lead without judgment, like I could have, I could have been like, I'm not going to make the call. Like, I'm not going to like, why would she even yell at me? But I went in deeper and I just said, Hey, this is our first interaction. And I happened to have my college diploma on my wall. And I said, Hey, is this how you spell your name? And she's like, well, yeah. And I said, that's my middle name. And I say, it's Marie. Obviously I said your name wrong. I won't do it again. And from that point, moving forward, we formed such a relationship. So as she came off the bus every day, I was like, Hey, Mari, how's it going? Mari, <laughs> you know, like just really forwarding it in. And my calling in this work, I feel like, especially with Mari is she was on the state girls basketball team as a sophomore this year. And when those announcers and officials pronounced her name wrong, you know, I was just like your morning announcements screaming her name correctly from the stands because that's my calling in life is to make sure that people know and see her and can pronounce her name correctly but that interaction could have gone south I, I, you froze hotel jessica you're starting to freeze a little bit i don't know if you're hearing me or not Let me see if I need to get her to come back in. Um, no. Yeah, I think you. I think you hear me. Stand by, folks, because if if uh, she has to come back in, then I'll go solo until she comes back. Um, oh no! Uh, yeah, we hear oh, you, right? Can okay. You hear me? Hotel. Yeah. Yes, I can hear you. Yeah, yeah, I hear you now. Okay. Oh. That's, Powerful that's, that's, story, and I had to cut out. Sorry about that. Yeah. yeah. Am I back? You're back. Okay. All right. So I think hopefully you caught some of that piece, and really the the gist of it was just that as a leader, you have to learn to let go of perceptions of and how kids are interacting because you're the adult, and you can learn a lot from them. And I think that's something for me. And I think we talked earlier too that, you know, in our community, even though we're considered rural, we have over 30 different languages within our communities and being open and vulnerable to understanding that um, our way isn't the right way. And I think I've learned a lot from just leaning into other people's culture, community, going to events that are outside of the norm for me to get a better understanding of building relationships with families has been really essential. Um, and then one other piece too with that, especially at the secondary level, is finding their passions and making a path. Um, we have a hard time with our students getting registered for sports, FAFSA applications, applying for college, the barriers around that for our students, especially with parents whose English is not their primary language. And so just because they don't have the same resources, that's not where, that's equality, that's not equity. And so we're finding different ways to really make the needs of families and students in our community because they just, they deserve more. They deserve a lot more than the, what they've gotten. And I feel like that's part of my calling is to try to help create that pathway for them. I'm glad you mentioned that word equity because um, that equality, as we talk about on this platform often, it, it just doesn't work. No. Nope. And, and, and equity is not something new. It's just some it's just a word attached to a practice that that should have been happening all along. Right now. Now, let me let me say this to one of our, our listeners. I've never seen this name before, but I'm glad you're here. Marino Marin. Um, what hold hold tight, because next week's guest, that is our topic. Superintendent uh, Anibal 
uh, Solaire out of uh, New York State. That is going to be our topic with everything you're talking about with the achievement gap, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So just join us next Saturday morning at 1055 and we're going to take a deep dive into into that with him um, based on what I know about him, his experiences and so forth. So again, next Saturday, Anibal Soleil. Uh, let's keep moving. So um, let me let me jump into grace with integrity. And I think this was the one of all the graces. This was the one that really jumped out at me on a personal level. Um, you say, be who you are, no matter who is watching. Right. And when I read that, I say, yep, that's me. <laughs> I'll, I'll, I'll use polite language on this one because I don't give a darn what anybody thinks about me right now i had to grow into that mm -hmm. right uh, that that wasn't always who i was and with a lot of us i don't think that's always who we were who have gotten to a point in our lives where i'm where 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 to quote i'm going to be my authentic self regardless of how i'm being perceived that's for some of us that it takes a while to get there Right. Let me mm -hmm. let me just say this real quick, Jessica, and then I'm gonna go right to my question. I found I, I'm not a tie guy, like necktie, bow to any tie. I'm not a tie guy. But I wore a tie. I never walked into that school as a teacher without a tie. But I was dressing for the students. I had an agenda, so I didn't mind that. As a principal, I never walked into that building without a tie. I'm old school. They never saw me with the school paraphernalia, that type of thing, except on weekends. But I always had on this suit and tie as a speaker. It was different. See, for, for the tie with the students, I'm modeling something as a speaker. I'm conforming to something as I thought. Right. I said, I'm wearing these ties that I don't like because there's an expectation as a keynoter that I should be wearing oh. these. Ties. So when the pandemic came. And I felt I saw myself doing 200 virtual presentations in 2020 from March to December, not wearing a tie once. I said, I'm not wearing a tie when I get back out on the road either. I, I, I like doing these presentations without these ties. I'm wearing like polo shirts and sweaters, which I've never done professionally. And that that pandemic allowed me to professionally speaking because personally i've always been where i need to be but professionally speaking be me so i haven't worn a tie and i've back, been back out on the road you know big time did one hundred fifty thousand miles in six months last year right so i've been back out there being myself so i'm saying to the folks out here watching before i go to the question are you being you and of course there are certain norms that that you've got to adhere to there's certain expectation i get all that but in your leadership are you able to be your authentic self or are you operating outside of yourself and therefore that's not even you leading that's 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 somebody else leading your school or someone else in that assistant principal capacity who's that leading your school becomes the question so 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 now um Here's my question for you. I, I know I went on a little so soliloquy, uh, Jessica, but what was your motivation for including grace with uh, including the word integrity? What, what, <laughs> make sure I'm where I was. I went on a soliloquy. Yeah. What was your motivation for including grace with integrity? It's that foundation of who you are is how you lead. And so who you are shows up outside of people seeing you. And so I think if you can really be, especially when you talk about serving students and finding that calling and that gift that you are uniquely served to do in your roles, if you don't have that foundation of doing the work, even when no one's watching, it's it, it really doesn't, it diminishes your ability to do it when people are. And so I think too that, that again, that calling isn't tied to your position. And so especially as we're talking about hiring season and should I stay in this job? Should I do this job? It's not about the job anymore. It's about how you're called to serve. And a lot of times when you're interviewing places, it's not just about you interviewing them. It's vice versa. They're interviewing you. You're interviewing them to make sure it's the right fit. Because if it's a place you can feel the vibe, if your energy isn't going to serve the purpose of the place you're going to, then stay where you're at. Because you'd much rather be somewhere without a title than somewhere in a title where you're trying to be somebody you're not. Mm -hmm. What about... um? 
here's the other thing I thought about when I was reading the the grace with integrity. I was thinking about code switching. Oh. And 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 and, and does grace with integrity does it eliminate or even alleviate the need for code switching or is that code switching somewhere does it still have to be there? I I would probably say maybe like you're a first interview with somebody you've never met before, you might have to kind of reel it in a little bit, the real cabine or the real capella. You know what I mean? But I think otherwise, when you're building those authentic relationships and having that integrity, yep, you are who you are. And this is how I show up in places. And I think that I think that's what I really leaned into um, serving in our community is they see me at church on Sunday playing drums. Like I literally come out of the drum set and the middle schoolers are like, what? Like, this is who she is. Like, this is, she's, she plays music. She um, serves at the, the church. She does things in the community. Like, this is who, just who I am. And, that, and I think once I felt more comfortable with that, I was less likely to hide those parts of me too when I walked back into the profession. So people know that I'm very connected to our um, Sudanese community. And that comes very evident with how I serve in our schools as well. Leading or, or, or grace with integrity. You know, um, another thought that came to my mind in reading that was I had an interview once, Jessica. Um, I, I, I left, I, I was in a district where we, our trajectory was really good. We, we, we were doing big things. I'll probably write a book about the experience at some point. But I decided I wanted something a little bit more competitive for me, meaning I wanted something that was at rock bottom and I want to, I want to build. I, I got to a point where I was very comfortable in my school. We, we still had a long way to go, but the foundational work was done. So I go to this interview at the time we're talking 2003, the New Jersey Nets, which are now the Brooklyn Nets, the New Jersey Nets were the hottest team in the Eastern conference. Jason Kidd was the hottest guard in the Eastern conference. Those of you that know basketball, you know what I'm talking about. And I said, I'm going to use that to get this principalship. So I walk into a conference room. There are about 15 people sitting at a conference room table. And as I walk in and they told me to sit at the head table, to head, the, the head of the table, I pulled out the seat. And as I sat down, I said, I'm the Jason kid you've been looking for. You need not look any further and sat down. Everyone looked at me with their mouths hung open. Right. And um, so they asked me about three questions. And then they told me I could go, superintendent. I thought I blew the job because I came in that way. He called me while I was still driving about 15 minutes in and said, you got the job. He said, that, wow. that, that, that intro, <laughs> that was it. That's all we needed, right? So here's my point in even bringing that up now. I went in as my authentic self. It wasn't like I was in there showboating. Someone might perceive that as being cocky and egotistical. No, I, I just went in there as my authentic self. And, and, and in being my authentic self, it sold me for that position, right? I didn't go in there code switching and saying all the right things that they would want to hear of a prospective principal. I said, I'm going to be me because guess what? Mm -hmm. When I take that job, I'm going to be me. So, so why, I don't know if you know this language, Jessica, you got to be a parliament funkadelic fan to understand this, but, but. I'm not going to go in there faking the funk, right? Yeah, and you got no P-Funk to know that one, right? I'm not faking the funk. I'm going to go in there and be me as I am on these Saturday broadcasts yeah. and, and out in the world. So I guess I'm preaching to somebody out there that's watching us this morning to say, yeah, work within the confines of the organization, but somewhere in there, you got to be you. Because mm -hmm. there's nothing more frustrating in trying to be outside of you. I love being me. I ain't trying to be somebody else, right? So, with that said, let's 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 jump into that communication, Graces. And 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 you said, watch what you say, and how you say it. And I wrote a note to myself here to repeat that: watch what you say, and how you say it. Right. So. With that being said, what are, what are the implications for one's leadership when they lack communications grace? Uh, losing your job, losing your career. If you cannot communicate clearly to the stakeholders that the message is being intended to, 
you aren't going to be in the position long, or you're going to be really frustrated when things aren't moving forward because it's lost in communication. And so that goes, that communication goes back to that vulnerability is asking people for feedback was how did, was this received? And I think one of the more challenging aspects of this is when you have to give um, as a leader, any type of negative feedback in regards to performance evaluation. One of the biggest pieces I've done is I've asked for feedback from the other stakeholders later on. So if I'm there with a union rep and a, and a, and a staff member later on, I'll say, was my message clear? Um, unfortunately, I've had to be in meetings where I've had expulsions um, for students. And I'm just super transparent at the beginning. I said, these are the toughest conversations I've ever had to have. When I get nervous, my hands move and I talk fast. And so you just need to know like that, if you need me to slow down, if you need me to repeat something, if we need to take a break, this is about you understanding the process and how we can support you. But I think we have to be really clear about our own messaging so it doesn't get lost in context. Because if I wasn't open with them saying, the reason I talk so fast or I'm doing this is because I'm really nervous because this is a really important and sad part of, of education. Like we made a poor choice and, and I want you to know that my nervousness isn't dismissive. It's because I care about you and as a family and I want to do the best to support you through the circumstance. But I think um, being open and then asking for feedback, like, did people hear me correctly? Like, did that come across clear? Is there a way I could do that differently? Just builds on your capacity to grow and learn and communicate um, in any role that you serve. So, so let me ask you this. Um, someone once said to me many, probably decades ago now, he, he or she, I don't know if it was a he or he or she, but somebody said, they said, Kefele, a word is like an arrow. Mm. Once you, once you release it, you can't retrieve it. It's gone. Right. So thinking about that leader that is deficient with communication grace and has released some words that are out there in the staff universe now that are out there in the student universe now or out there in the parent universe now how can they retrieve those words meaning what can they do to gain credibility again i think owning it apologizing for it and not doing it again so if it's if it's like whatever whatever the feedback was, just being super intentional of not doing it again, owning it, apologizing for it, and moving forward in whatever form, like maybe maybe it was the way in which it was sent. Like sometimes it seems easier to send something in an email, but it's the exact opposite because you might be paying for that email for years or interactions down the road. So making sure that you find the form of communication that that message will be best received in too. You know, um, we got three more questions, but I want to I want to put this on the screen again before we get to the very end. Right. Lead with grace. Jessica Cabine, subtitle leaning into the soft skills of leadership. You can get this at Amazon. I'm sure Barnes and Noble dot com has it. Um, so you order your copy. It's a dynamite book, dynamite book. In describing Jessica, Principal Cabine grace in relationships you say interact with manners mindfulness and meaning once again interact with manners mindfulness and meaning how does one sustain grace in leadership i mean grace in relationships given the often overwhelming challenges obstacles pressures demands that an AP will face, a new leader will face, a veteran leader will face, that if not careful, can have one literally operating out of character. Mm -hmm. How does one maintain that grace in relationships under those circumstances? Two, two pieces of advice I wish I would have learned a long time ago. Um, it's okay to shut your door and it's okay to say you don't have a minute. Mm. As an assistant principal, you're going to always get the knock, knock, knock. You got a minute, knock, knock, knock. You got a minute. I'm going to tell you right now, I've set the timer. It's never a minute. When anybody says that you got a minute, it's never a minute. And there's always follow-up and things behind that. And it's okay to shut your door. 
I think that's that's something I've learned, um, and I communicate that with my staff too. So um, if my door is shut, I usually have a sign that just says I'm, I'm in a meeting or I need a minute. I even have a zones of regulation board on my office, which tells if I'm in the green zone or the red zone, and staff will change my card. They can read my body language like, you are you are not to be talking to anybody. Your energy needs a break. And so I think just making sure you're, you're self-regulated so you're ready to lead in the role you're serving. Because if you're not regulated, the way you respond could cause major damage in relationships. So just you can't always control what people say, but you can control how you respond and having those regulation strategies, whether it's deep breathing, um, drinking, like having some coffee or tea in your hand, going for a walk being around kids, reconnecting with your calling before you re-engage in the next thing. So you don't take that baggage to the next meeting and the next meeting is really, really important. So, so that, that one out there I'm thinking about, cause I'm, I'm, I'm like you with that, but now that you didn't give that person that minute that they asked for, and that next person may not have gotten it either. And that third person, and now they're in the teacher's lounge having a conversation about your inaccessibility or they're mm -hmm. in the parking lot having that conversation. How do you come back from that? Now, you may never hear about that, but there may be some people in your circle that the rest of the staff don't realize are in your circle and you may hear it that way. How do you how do you come back from that situation? Well, and I think, too, the thing is, is just because you didn't have a minute then doesn't mean you don't have a minute later in the day. So it's following up with them. So maybe that minute and then being transparent with why you needed a minute. Uh, I've had, a, I had a staff member come in and they could definitely see I was visibly upset. And they're like, do you need me to leave? I said, nope, if you don't mind just sitting here for one minute so I can regulate. I just had a really difficult conversation on the phone and I just need a minute. You could sit here with me because no one's going to interrupt us. If you can just let me take some deep breaths, it's okay to be transparent with them. So if got a minute. Yeah. Hey, can you just sit here so I can just finish this email off to a parent? Like, so then they see like, Hey, I want to have time with you, but I can't have competing priorities because, um, oh my gosh, what is that? Fractured attention fractures relationships from the Mayo Clinic Guide to Stress-Free Living. Fractured attention fragments fractures relationships. So like if, if you're trying to multitask and answer emails and listen to a staff member, they're going to know you're not paying attention. If you're looking at your phone and not listening to the family, they're going to realize that you're diminishing that communication skills. So I think just being honest. So even if they say, hey, you got a minute? Yep, just have a seat and I'll finish this. Or just being transparent. They'll start to get your communication vibe. I also, within my calendar, and I know it's harder for assistant principal Polls. But like, if you need me, I'm in the halls, catch me in the halls. But if I have my door shut, it's some deep work time and I got to get a report done or something. But I think being really transparent with your time and setting those boundaries kind of helps set some boundaries for staff too. Good stuff. I love it. I love it. I got two more for you. Okay. In describing social grace oh, or social graces, yeah. you say interact and act online. In other words, you're, you're talking about online usage in this chapter of the book. Again, lead with grace, right? Um, what suggestions do you have? You know, this, we could, any of these, you know, this, you got a lot of pages in this book. <laughs> we, we could spend hours on just one mm -hmm. chapter or even one, se one section of a chapter. This one in particular, right? So, so, so what suggestions do you have for our viewers out there? about proper usage of social media while simultaneously serving as a school leader. Because mm -hmm. I'm convinced that there are people that don't understand that. I see it. I, I see it with my own eyes. I'm like SMH or SMDH, right? And, and it's like, what are you doing? Mm -hmm. what, do you think? what do you think, principal? Well, and it's fun because um, Jill Rowley's on here and she's the kindergarten principal now where I left. And I'm going to tell you now, social media likes looks a lot different in kindergarten than it does in middle school. Yeah. And I think one of the biggest pieces, and Joe Sanfilippo does this all the time, is in the absence of knowledge, people will create their own. So middle school has a wrap of being, you know, fights and vaping and everything. And so the more messaging we can get out there that's positive and interacts and shows that the kids are engaged and learning, the less of the negative noise that could come through on that. Um, I would also say, though, too, and, and if you do have like a social media feed for your school, you're never going to win a war on social media. So don't fight the battle. Yeah. So if people are putting those comments in, just just let it go and let it roll unless it becomes something where like HR needs to be involved. But for otherwise, let it go, let it roll and move on, because you're it's just sometimes 
and when I wrote this, it wasn't social media has just really taken a swing right now that is a little disturbing and discomforting because here we are trying to champion kids and students, but we're attacking each other in the comments. So I think knowing that um, it's better just to pick up the phone or to just walk away from it, but being able to use social media as a tool to show and support the learning and the growth in the community in your school is so important and powerful. And so the more you do the positive, hopefully the less you'll see the negative. Yeah. Yeah. So there's, 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 there's so much to say about social media, mm -hmm. even, even, even just the pictures, you know, e even the disclosure, yeah, you know, I don't, you know, I let the world in on, on, on me to an extent, I'm not showing the world everything. And sometimes I see folks and I'm like, you really want that out there? Or no. even some comment, you really want that out there? Do you realize your staff might read that? Or, But it only takes one staff member to see it because then they can share it to everybody else, right? So just, you know, just being cautious and careful. Yeah. I feel like I'm I'm talking because when I was in the middle school before that was when Facebook was first coming out and I always my mantra to the kids was if you wouldn't say it on the phone or to your friend or to your grandmother at church don't say it on social media and I feel like sometimes adults could probably use the same rules and guidance too. Yes, that's right. That's right. Mm -hmm. I got one more for you, and then we, okay. we jump into our rapid fire bam questions. So Ooh. my last one in in describing grace with yourself, Elf. you say pause in the pace of all this grace. That's interesting the way you, you you frame that. Again, pause in the pace of all this grace. What is your intended message to leaders when you say grace with yourself? So often we extend grace to everybody else but ourselves. We will go cover a teacher's classroom so they can go see their kid's concert and miss our own. We will come to work sick every single day, but yet push people out the door with the milk pails because they're sick. I think so often we afford grace to everybody else that we forget to give it to ourselves. And so that's where that, and that's why it, that chapter is at the very end of the book too, is because when you're thinking about serving and supporting and communicating and social media and leading authentically and leading with integrity, sometimes you just got to slow down in the pace of trying to be a principal or seeking a position and just and just be well with yourself and not be on all the time and just really, really, really take care of yourself in whatever avenue that looks like, because this work is challenging, but it's worth it. But um, you have to be ready for it. Yeah, you got to, you, you, as, as you say, you got to take it down sometimes. Mm -hmm. and, and that's, you know, I was I was on January, February, January, and February and March and then April and May. I gotta take care of me. Mm -hmm. June, July, and August are coming, so I'll, I'll I'll just holler at somebody out there real quick. You heard you heard Principal Cabine. Despite the fact that you're trying to elevate your game, we get it, but at some point you got to take it down because you've got to sustain balance. You can't be up here all the time because if you're up here all the time, you're probably taking it to sleep with you, and you're probably up here in your dreams. You know, your, 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 your interrupted sleep, all that kind of thing. So you got to bring it down, right? Grace with yourself. Let me ask you this before we go to the rapid fire. How do you keep grace within yourself, Jessica Cabin? Uh, I have learned to say no a lot more than yes. And it seems kind of silly, but um, we talked about it too, is as I do some coaching and I do some speaking, but I say no more than I say yes now because I know what's really important. And I've got a, a 17 year old in the hotel room that I'm going to be spending the rest of the day with. And I've got a almost 16 year old that I'm scared about driving, but I also know in four years they're going to be gone. Yeah. And I don't want their, their time with me to be considered the, the one who is working all the time, speaking all the time, doing all those things. So just being intentional about when I'm doing and what I'm doing and who I'm doing it for. Love it. Love it. And I, I see the comments. Folks are loving it as well. I think that grace, I think that grace with yourself is resonating mm -hmm. with a lot of people on here. Because we don't take care of ourselves. We take care of everybody else. We take on the burdens, the worries, the concerns, the negative feedback, but we don't take care of ourselves and we don't just sit with the compliments. So if I can just go back to that at the beginning too, like you are doing good work. And unfortunately, we don't do a great job of sharing that with each other as much as we should. Yeah. 
And you know, you, you, you tweeted this morning and you said something I've never heard before. You said you're taking care of self care and all. full care. Yeah. Mm -hmm. As you That's did book number five coming out as soon as my editor is knocking on the door to get that done. But self and soul care is something I'm really focusing on. Oh, OK. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Self and soul care. Yeah. I like that. Let's go to these rapid fire. Ooh, this, geez, OK. People struggle with these. It's, it's, it's <laughs> one word answer or one sentence. Sometimes See, my, my AP, Chris, Chris Devine would think this is hilarious because he's like, she's not going to be able to do this. She can't not say more than a sentence. So here we go, Chris. Let's do this. Here we go. All right. Is okay. education on the right path for underserved children? Not yet. Can true equity occur in America's schools for black, brown, and other underserved students? It better someday soon. Does Jessica Cabine's work contribute to the progress we desperately need? Yes. If you could do a reset, on your life, would your line of work be different or the same? The same. Why do you continue to do this work? I love who I serve and the community I serve. What fires you up within the work that you do? My students. What do you dislike about the work that you do? The politics and the pressures outside of the, the school walls. That is everybody's answer. <laughs> what, is, <laughs> what has been your greatest victory in this work? Being the, the principal of my two boys. So being a parent and a principal in my career has been, been a bucket list. What was your greatest mistake in this work? Leading from a title and not leading as myself. What has been your greatest challenge? learning to balance it all are you proud of your first year as an assistant principal yes yes are you proud of your first year as a principal yes who inspires you in this work my students and my community and what my you, family. very good what are you reading right now uh the ruthless elimination of hurry mm. Mm. <laughs> check that out myself. <laughs> what book do you recommend for our viewers? Cultural Responsive Teaching in the Brain by Zaretta. Uh, I interviewed her um, on a different platform that I have about about two months ago, but I'm gonna bring her on this platform. Please, oh, yeah. wonderful. Yeah, we're gonna bring her on probably in the fall. Uh, Zaretta Hammond. What do you want to accomplish that you haven't accomplished yet? I am going to work to try to flip the high school experience to make it meaningful and relevant and aspire to help all kids see themselves as successful adults. Are you satisfied with where you are professionally now? I'm pinching myself that I'm here today. Yes. <laughs> Cannot believe it. What could you say to a viewer out there who continues to face closed doors? Ensure that your calling isn't tied to a position and know that your opportunities are coming forward and reach out. Reach out and ask for help. Please ask for help. We're here to help and serve. What could you say to a viewer out there who's lost their fire? Find your calling. Reconnect with a kid. Reconnect with that calling, whatever that is. And lastly, if Principal Jessica Cabin was a word in a dictionary, what would be your definition? Authentic. Authentic. I love it. Hey, we came, we've come to the end, and I want to thank you immensely for this great conversation with you. As I always say when I feel it, you hit it out the park. Oh. You hit it out. Grand. Wow. I see y'all, y'all, y'all giving me the fire before I asked for it. I appreciate that. If, if if you felt this today, if it was worth your while, you, worth your 90 minutes or however many minutes you've been on, just give us some fire, give us some diamonds, give us some, whatever emoji, some hearts, whatever ones that you like best and uh, put them on the thread for us so we could see them. That's the applause that we give to the guests. So give us some fire. I see it coming. I see it. I see it. Oh, Gina Jeffries, I see you out there. Gina Jeffries out there in East St. Louis. You're on the list. I will be calling you. 
to be on this platform, right? So uh, this first time I saw your name on there. Yeah, I, look, you see all that fire, Jessica? It's a wow. Lot of yeah, 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 yeah. Good stuff. Jessica, again, first, this is her book, Lead with Grace, right? Go to Amazon right now. Let's keep that pattern. Y'all be taking these books to number one, y'all, right? So, so right on Amazon, I, I don't know what cat, I forgot what cat, I think you're in the administration category. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so just get your copy today and um, or get it whenever you can. Those of you who are going to watch this on the, as a video later, get it when you can, but get it soon. Get it today. Get it now and get it out the way, right? Principal Cabine, how can they get in touch with you or follow you or or, or invite you out to give a, a full day workshop on leadership or your, your other topics? Holler at them. All right. So I'm on the socials, Instagram and Facebook and uh, Twitter at, at Jessica Cabine. Uh, and then I have my website, jessicacabine.com. Um, I'm, I'm my own person. So you DM you anything, you email me, you're going to get the real me. No, nobody else. So I'm here to help and serve. And uh, I love just to, to connect with other leaders and hopefully help you guys continue to find that calling and continue in this work. Good stuff. Good stuff. Once again, folks. Lead with Grace, Jessica Cabine. Lead with Grace, great book. Great Thank you book. so much. I appreciate yeah. all you do. It's an honor to be here again today. Really, truly has been fun. Appreciate you. Jessica, stay there for me as I close okay. out. When I go off, still stay, right? Okay. Uh, folks, appreciate you being here. Before you leave, next week, as I said before, I got Superintendent and Nebel Solaire, that's my man out of um, New York State, Schenectady, New York. He's the superintendent there. Uh, he'll be my guest. Also, um, as I, as, as my, my crew, we always promote each other. Sean, Facebook Live every Saturday. Sean Hurt, except today, he's, he's, he's speaking today. But Sean Hurt at 10 o'clock. Principal Hurt, Create and Educate with Dr. Sheikha Houston and Tammy Taylor. Principal Tammy Taylor, soon to be Dr. Taylor. 10.30 every Saturdays. Um, unlock the middle with my man Josh Tovar and the crew on Sat Sunday nights at seven. E these are all Eastern times, by the way. And then the Village Leadership Group with Dr. Roz Gaskins and Coach Williams Tuesdays and Thursdays at six o'clock. My, um, you know, I, I, I put a post up yesterday. ASCD gave me a whole page in the in a new catalog with all the books I've written for them. I just want to promote the new ones real quick: the Equity and Social Justice Education Fifty. The assistant principal 50 and the aspiring principal 50. All of these, all of my eight ASCD books, all well, seven of my eight are bestsellers. This one is not. And I know why, but I'm not going to get into it right now. But I'll say this briefly. I gave it the wrong title. It's Confused America. Right. But but be that as it may, this needs to be a bestseller too. Not meaning putting more money in my pocket but meaning that this book needs to be in the hands of folks who aspire to become an AP or principal, right? So um, the aspiring principal 50, get your hands on this one as well. Um, and then let's see, visit principalcafele.com for all my resources. Subscribe to the Virtual AP Leadership Academy YouTube channel so that you don't miss anything. Subscribe to that. And then also like and follow the Virtual AP Leadership Academy Facebook page. You know, the Saturday Academy is part one. Then part two is the commentary that I write early Sunday morning, every Sunday morning. So tomorrow morning, I'll have the new commentary up, which will be rooted in today's discussion. So that'll be um, tomorrow, not later than 10 a.m. My commentary will be posted. So you got to like and follow that Virtual AP Leadership Academy Facebook page to be able to read it because I don't post it anywhere else. That's the only place I posted to keep the authenticity, speaking of that word, of that particular channel. And then lastly, your diet, your exercise, and your COVID precautions. I'm not going to get detailed. We're we almost at one o'clock. Just you know what you got to do. You know what you got to do. Principal Cabine did her run this morning. I'm going to do my run later on today. Then I'm going to sit back and watch some basketball. The playoffs start today. So, you know, I'll be watching that. But other than that, Thanks for being here, and we will see you all next Saturday, same time, 1055 EST. And just let me say this to you real quick. I know folks are leaving, but starting in May, every first Saturday after that, I'm going solo.
I'm going back to my roots. I'm going solo first Saturdays, and then we have guests for the rest of the month. But every first Saturday, just put that in your calendar. I'm not going to have a guest. I'm just going solo like I did for a year before I started bringing on guests. And then also, if I'm not, yeah, that first Saturday in May this year is the second anniversary of this platform. So you know I'm bringing flames um that first saturday in may because that's the second anniversary we still going strong so uh be sure to join us on that second uh that that second anniversary first saturday in may with that said you all have a great week have an extraordinary week have your best week yet peace peace thumbs up cock that fist back count to three one two three I'll see you next week. Stay safe. And if you're on spring break, enjoy it.